Hello and welcome to another episode of Little Knowledge Podcast. Hello. This time on Little Knowledge. Wait for your hello. Wait in the what? wings. He's, he's oh. eager, you know. He really is. You've got to keep him on reins half the time. Honest, honest to goodness. Tonight or this evening on Little Knowledge Podcast, we are going to be talking about Llanrymney Hall and it will involve mysteries, history, murder, and possibly and hopefully a brighter future. Now, I'm Paul Busby, and with me, I'm not alone, is Gough Morgan. Hello, Gough. Hello. <laughs> Greetings to you. I leapt in far too quickly. I do apologise. There we are. I like the Hello, eagerness. Mr. B. Well, yeah, no, I've been sitting here with my earphones plugged in. Oh, some people mentioned about, again, that our disparity of microphones. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it because of cost. But are you aware there is a subtitle option in the bottom corner of the screen there? Click on that. It's not too bad. It's, it's like a bit like old CFAX, but it works. Showing my age now. Look at that. I mentioned CFAX. Oh. People alive never heard of CFAX now. That, sh that shows how classy you are, Goff. You were a CFAX <laughs> guy rather than teletext. That was... <laughs> you can always tell, you know. You know how'd you down as a CFAX, man? <laughs> okay, so if I said to you, uh, Clan Rumney Hall, would that mean yeah. that much to you? Well, um, yes, for someone who was in the area. I can't tell you exactly why. I mean, obviously, the big connection we know is Captain Henry Morgan. He very up at the Diga House a lot when we, I talk about him. Um, but also, every time you, if you drive along the old A48 out of Cardiff and you come up, you do see the old signs for, like, you know, uh, the Flanner and the Hall and Captain Henry, all sorts of things around that area. So there's lots of indications of it as a place. However, age of building and whatever, no, don't know a great deal, to tell you the truth. Well, we haven't strayed too far. Last week, we were at Malpas Court in Newport talking about Thomas Prothero. Um, mm -hmm. Until 1938, you know, San Romney Hall was in Monmouthshire. It was only as late as 1938 when it was sort of sucked into uh, Cardiff. Oh, right. Oh, that's interesting. With a great Cardiffian expansion, which some say has not yet ceased. <laughs> uh, but I always love, with these buildings, the building is, is great, yes, but it's the site which is often so historic. In the case of Llan Rumney, Llan uh, meaning church or chapel in this instance, yeah. uh, suggests there was an ecclesiastic building there before the, uh, before the house. And indeed, it came under the, the uh, control of Kingsham Abbey. Oh, that's uh, intriguing. Back when. They think they got it in about 1066, so it was a Norman thing, but Cainshan Abbey in uh, Somerset. So that perhaps explains the clan bit, the chapel, so, the church. So they, so they actually got that chapel in 1066, so well, it's part of the Norman expansion and uh, stamping your brand on South Wales then, is it? When it, when it Mm -hmm. But you bung up, you know, you bung up your castles and you, you and you populate them, and you, then you do your church fronts and you, you know, so you're really stamping your brand on the southeast Wales, aren't it? Yeah, abbeys had large catchment areas, of course. I mean, you would often yeah. find something like Llantarnam Abbey coming under, you know, near Glastonbury, that sort of thing. So they had big oh, old yeah. catchment areas. Um, but absolutely true. We think the first house that's recorded on the site of Clan Rumney Hall was probably about 1450, uh, that sort of area. Yeah. Um, but it was with the dissolution of the monasteries, of course, that it became something of a free for all, a chance to have a house on that <coughs> spot of land. And one of the more durable of the South Wales families claimed it as a house, and that was the Chemis family, perhaps better known as being from Kevin Mabley. Yes. So the chemist family took over uh, that. And they lived there until they did what often happens. If you're an aristocratic family in southeast Wales, it won't be long before whether you want to or not, and maybe you do it accidentally, you marry a Morgan. <laughs> yeah. And that's what happened. Yes. Uh, As I say, there were a lot of them and they circulated, to quote yeah. Yes, that's like, yeah, there's, yeah, there's always another Morgan somewhere, you know. And I, uh, the man yeah. Viscount Godfrey said in the 18th, 19th century that the best thing about being a Morgan was you could get your pedigree from anywhere. <laughs> very yeah, true. They got, they got it onto so many other people's family trees, didn't they? Very, very true. Um, so the Morgans got hold of it. Now, the Morgans of Flan Rumney, because they married a daughter, chemist's daughter, you see. So yeah. the Morgans inherited it that way. And the Morgans of Flan Rumney were a cadet branch of the Morgans of Tredegar. They had lots of these cadet branches 
all over South Wales, all over Wales, actually. So mm. they became far more of a clan than a family, which is yeah. very good politically as a power base, what, having all those family members. What does cadet branch actually mean? And where does it come from? Because I've heard that phrase many times, but I don't know what it means. Uh, it, it's simply an offshoot. Oh, just an oh, offshoot of the family tree. It's an offshoot which, who almost uh, acknowledge the senior branch. So it's oh, like put right. little acorns all around the place. Yeah. Younger sons have got to be given homes. And if you're on one spot for so long, there's a lot of younger sons with a lot of new homes and a lot of cadet branches to your family what tree. You mean. Right, I see what you mean. Yeah. Now, that's, now I know what it means now. Ah, now right, I see. Now the most famous, we think, uh, from this, and actually let's have a little look at... Because uh, I'm talking about this place. There's Llanrumney Hall. Oh. As we see it today. I'm going to say, that's not what I was expecting. No, I well, was, I was course, expecting it to be an older building, a Tudor building or whatever, you know. Well, of course, it was, uh, at the, uh, it was an Elizabethan building for the longest time with bits mm. of the older uh, medieval work uh, involved in it as well. Uh, this is what it looks like today, but perhaps the most famous uh, person connected with it, you've already mentioned, Goff, is this man. <laughs> Captain Henry, dear me, yeah. I've always thought that Captain Henry looks like a, a slightly murderous, um, oh dear, what's who's that kid's cartoon character? Pugwash, yes, he looks like a slightly psychotic version of Captain Pugwash. <laughs> if, ever, if Captain Pugwash had been a sort of supervillain, then this would have been his alter ego nemesis, wouldn't it? You know, he would oh, have yeah. been split into two separate characters. But he's definitely got that pug wash look about him. I often wonder whether they did sort of base the character slightly on these drawings. Well, it's entirely possible, isn't it? Now, we, we could do... That a... round face and the curly moustache. Yeah. We could do an entire episode, <laughs> and we will, I think, on Sir Henry Morgan. But at this point, it's the question is, was he born at Llan Rumney Hall in 1635, as so many people are extremely confident about? Um, it is possible. One of the last biographers of uh, Henry Morgan, Terry Breverton, is absolutely certain that he's cracked the case. And he was born at Flanrumney Hall. Now, we oh, know right. for a fact that his wife was from Flanrumney. So in Jamaica, Henry, who became Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica, names two patches of land, two estates there, one Flanrumney and one Pencarn. Yeah. Now, Flan Rumney does suggest for his wife why he would name a patch of land Pen Khan. And by the way, Pen Khan is a, a large patch of land. It was a greater Pen Khan farm, which is only a stone's throw, really, from uh, Tradiga House. Yes, and it should perhaps be pointed Rumney. out that one of the, after the Panama unpleasantness, the Morgans of Tradiga spoke up for Captain uh, uh, Sir Henry Morgan. Uh, Henry Morgan. And they described him as a relation and a former near neighbour. Yes. Now, yeah. Pencarn is very near. Yeah. Now, I wonder, now most people think it's Lanrum, Neil, right? Most historians do. I do wonder about Pencarn, and I do wonder, perhaps, is it possible he was born at Lanrumney and then lived at Pencarn yeah. at some point? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not possible. Sometimes it always gets me when these arguments split into either or. Mm. You know, there is a version where it could be both. Quite. You know, when you have to see that sometimes he's coming up with an argument that satisfies both, it's probably going to be nearer the truth. So if only the rules frequently don't happen, they're very arbitrary. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, so it's, it's a possibility. I mean, um, like I said, most historians tend to, to go to Flan Rumney. The Pencarns had a branch of Morgans living in Pencarn, you see. And if you want to mm. make a broad brush, and this is why I find it interesting, you could say the Tredega Morgans are the senior branch. You could say the Llantarnum Morgans are the Catholic branch. And the Pencarn Morgans were always the warriors. Oh. And the, way, the way the Henry suggests is he was brought up not with the book, but with the pike. It's oh, very Pencarn. Um, yeah. But anyway, we'll, we'll get back to Henry at a later date, won't we? Yeah. Let's come back. There we are, back with the land of the living. So it is, a, a, it is a house. You have families coming there. You have families leaving there as all as a house. It's quite a large estate, about 700 acres, around about the oh, time the nice. Kenneth family were there. So not bad for a younger son. No, pretty uh, good. Making his mark. But outsiders came in as well. And after the Morgans left in the early 18th century, 
In the early 19th century, the house was completely rebuilt, so it started to look a bit like we see it today, and we saw it on that last photograph. Yeah. And, it's, uh, that very, it's a very Jane austen -y sort of building there, isn't it? You know, oh, yeah. You, well, you yeah. see ladies, ladies in high frocks coming out, having very animated conversations about pianos. <laughs> you can see that it's that sort of building. <laughs> I think it is, yeah. But we have our first legend appearing now, Goff, our first legend. Because between 1812 and 1823, a Bradford Collier owner who moved to South Wales and could well be the founding father of Blackwood, that's what he's remembered oh, as, yeah. John Hodder Mogridge, made his home at San Romney Hall. Yeah. Uh, and while he was there, he discovered, according to his daughter, something very interesting. He discovered in the old, ancient, he called it, the thickest wall of San Romney Hall, he said he found a coffin with a uh, headless, the remains of a headless body within, in the wall. And he told his daughter that what he'd actually found was none other than the last native Prince of Wales, Llewellyn the last, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, who died in 1282 at the hands of King Edward I. Now, well, blimey. Legend indeed. I mean, what I would argue is, uh, first of all, is it possible? Well, we don't know where, we know what happened to his head. It was put on a spike and uh, yeah. headed off to London. But we never really knew what happened to his body. It's true to say that Edward I, for all his ruthlessness, was a pious man. And the rumour was he had agreed that uh, Llewellyn would be buried on consecrated ground. Now, of course, oh, in the early so, 1800s, yeah. no, Santana Abbey isn't consecrated ground, no. but it would have been in 1282. Yes, yes, exactly. So did he send yeah. the body to be buried quietly uh, on consecrated land? And did Mogridge find that body at last in the walls of uh, Llan Rumney Hall in the well, 1820s? That's, that's where it, it trips me up, frankly. Mm. Because while there's always loads and loads of legends of, oh, mm. pardon me, bad back again, loads and loads of legends of people being buried in walls, and we know that these, these things did take place, they're very infrequently buried in a coffin, because generally you're getting rid of the body. Mm. So to bury a coffin in the wall, I mean, it is, you do have immurement, but I mean, do we have any idea of suggestion of how it was lying, this coffin? We have very little. It's very frustrating. But the fact that it was a stone coffin suggests they may well have built on top of it. Well, that's what I'm thinking. If it's a stone coffin and it's been and it's flat and they built up on it, they've used it as a foundation stone. Then yeah, you could have. You very likely could have found the coffin under a wall. Coffin mm. was there first. Wall went on top afterwards. In yeah. that case, you could yes. If it's a stone a stone casket. Yeah. But the problem is, why don't we know anything other than that? A tale told by a daughter many years later. I mean, uh, didn't he get it looked at? Didn't he? Doesn't it appear in his letters? It's it's a legend, though, isn't it? I mean, what do we want, really? It's still it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, still, it's intriguing, nonetheless. I mean, it's, it's still intriguing, nonetheless. Yeah. Well, no, what we I need mean, the, the first thing bothered would have gone now if, if you found a find a body in your wall nowadays. Good lord, you couldn't <laughs> just you know politely mention it to your daughter over a scone. <laughs> And then just carry on as if nothing had happened. By the way, we'll go find a corpse in the wall this morning, darling. How did you? Didn't have a head. Didn't have a head. Oh, there's no idea we know who it is then. <laughs> yeah, that was very strange. Yes, they had a very peculiar sort of attitude to these sort of things then. Well, what they needed, of course, was an historian. And one moved in in uh, the 1850s to the, one of the next sort of uh, tenants of San Romney Hall. And I look at your beard there, Goff, and, and I'm impressed. Thank you. I'm impressed until I show you one of the Sam Rumney Hall tenants. And then, quite frankly, you need to up your game. Because if we go along here, there we go. Oh. Pretty good. It's not. I mean, if I undo, if I undid the, the, the nice neat tie at the bottom, I'd be down to my knees. Man. Ooh. Talk is yeah. cheap, Goff. Be an envy. <laughs> well, it's a man. fantastic, fantastic sort of Darwinian beard, isn't it? <laughs> it is great. It's very 1850s, I yeah. think, for a, an academic. Yeah. Uh, this is Edward Augustus Freeman. 
who was professor of modern history at Oxford University, the historian for the Norman Conquest, and okay. quite often um, a bit of a busy body as well. Now, historians can be rather eccentric people, and uh, they can sometimes focus on tiny little bits of detail, and they are adamant about it, really? and they get furious about it. <laughs> and one of the little details that Professor Freeman got a little angry about was the name of his new home. Oh, God. Um, there was not enough evidence for Professor Freeman that there was, in fact, a chapel on the site of Clanrumney Hall, and he believed that it was actually originally Glanrumney Hall, Glan being bank or slope, and it is on the banks of the Rumney. So oh, he th that, that, does so, that does sound reasonable, doesn't it? It does sound reasonable. It is reasonable, but he got very irate about this. He said to one person, um, do, you can call it Glanrumney with one L, because <laughs> it's altered. You can call it Glanrumney, but do yeah. not call it Clan Romney with two L's. He was so adamant that a century after his death, when a newspaper published an article on Clan Romney Hall, they said that there would be a man spinning angrily in his grave <laughs> at the fact that two L's is the accepted spelling yeah. of Clan Romney Hall. Uh, and also he hated hunting. And what he would do sometimes is, if, uh, if the hunt came, he would see them off in an aggressive fashion and then write in his diary, I saw off the hunt again. <laughs> there he is. Oh, now that's a splendid, yes, okay. No, 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 he has, he has picked me to the post on that facial hair. There's no two ways about it. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's a, it's a lovely little sketch, isn't it? It's cracker. I mean, I, don't, I quite like Professor Freeman, really. He's quite an interesting character. And actually, he was um, pivotal in the restoration of St. Mellon's Church. St. Mellon's Church is a fascinating old building. Oh, yeah. And with, I don't know if I noticed it. Oh, it's a beautiful building. And he helped oh. restore it in the 1850s. Mm. But he was only at uh, Llan Romney Hall for about five years before he moved on. He was in liberal politics. Yeah. Uh, he was involved uh, in Greece. He taught the man that found Knossos, uh, the great Greek archaeological discovery. So an important character, Professor, yeah. uh, uh, Professor Freeman. Um, mm. We'll have to get rid of his beard before you get envious, beyond envious. But now we come to your little bit, Gob, ah. because uh, eventually uh, Llan Romney Hall passed on to the Williams family, the last family to actually own it. And the Williams family were, were from Killian originally. They were oh, a, well, it was a tanner from Killian who married well. Yeah. And he married, he moved to Cardiff, and he married one of the David family of Llandaff, so a big, big family. Mm and had enough money eventually to... Uh, I'll tell you where their main home in Cardiff was. It was Roth Court, which is now a funeral home. Oh, yes, I've seen I know that. You drive past it on the way in. You Roth do. Yeah, 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 you I've do. I've seen that for a years. Good Lord. So a younger son ended yeah. up uh, at, uh, at Llanrumney uh, Hall. Uh, so the Williamses <coughs> were there, and they're the family we're talking about from here on in, all right? When we mention right. Slan Romney Hall, it's the Williamses. We know where yep. we are. I was just thinking, if they were from Killian, do you think they were ever tenants of Mr. Thomas Prothero's Killian <laughs> charity? No wonder they left and moved to car. Yeah, moved very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so do you think the landlord is, dear? Oh, my God, though. No. Yes. <laughs> Pack up, dear. Um, but we come yes, now to... Yeah, if I can part, it's 1874, isn't it, Goff, where it something is. unpleasant happens. We have a murder. Oh, before we do that, could you explain why you're always going to be the murder man when we do these oh, episodes? Well, because basically, right, in, in my sort of shadowed past, I have written an awful lot of murder mysteries and, and role play mysteries and stuff. Oh, I, was 18, thinking of, uh, I was thinking of your bedtime stories as a child. Oh my! <laughs> oh well, that was Nana, dear Nana. Yeah, Nana used to love a good murder. Nana was 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 uh, born in 1896, and um, she would sit there. Yeah, she just loved following them. They were sort of like soap operas. So she would sit there even at sort of the end of end of her life when she was stripping her gears slightly, and she'd say, "Oh, listen to this," and she'd read out the latest murder in the paper. And by the time she got to the bottom, she'd just go back and start again. So if you were careful, you got the same three murder three times in a row. But so no, I mean, right, when I was a child, you know, a lot of other children were told things, you know, traditional fairy tales, stories and, 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 and babes in the wood and all this sort of thing. My grandmother told me about Crippin, 
Jack the Ripper and George Egg the acid, acid bath murderer. I think I also had John Smith Brides in the Bath as well. So you so didn't get my... you didn't get Harry Potter, you got Harry Shotter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Sorry. Oh, please, please. That really wasn't any need for that sort of thing. It never yeah. is. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, so I was brought up with sort of with murder as a sort of entertainment. And again, I've always had a sort of slightly dark sense of humor as a result of that. And written written loads of sort of murder mysteries and stuff myself now. So murder and I our fellow travellers. I just hope nobody ever investigates my Google search because it's going to throw up some very alarming things. <laughs> Particularly my researches into poisons. Dear me. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a picture of the house of that time, or oh, close right. to that time, and I shall let you tell us uh, what happened. Right, well, it, it, it kicks off uh, on June the 3rd, 1874, when a farmer in an adjacent property to the estate uh, Mr. Uh, Hughes, uh, but basically lost the sheep. So he heads out into the fields to attempt to discover his sheep. And notice this, shall only be described as a very unpleasant aroma emitting from a hedgerow at the side. And on investigation discovers the body of, uh, of a woman, a middle-aged woman there, who uh, has obviously died in unpleasant circumstances. Now the papers at the time go into incredibly lurid detail about this. They absolutely, because so the Victorians loved sensation. They say they, they were starved of sensation. If you think of the amount of crime fiction and everything that comes out of us to, on the television stuff today, this was their crime story. These were their Sherlock's, their so-and-so. And you're also at the same time getting the rise of um, inspectors in the police force and the detective agencies in the police force. So this body is discovered. Um, he goes back and they send up um, an inspector Shepherd from Cardiff to go and investigate the scene and they find various you know items associated uh, with the deceased um, who had apparently been hit on struck on the head and then had a very unpleasantly had a throat cut um, and then they track it track it all back to so and so now she was uh, Mrs Susan Gibbs knee if I check her name properly now uh, where are we Ingrams knee Ingrams now, she was a, a very well brought up lady. Um, she was born on a Jersey, St. Helier's, uh, privately educated, had worked extensively uh, as a lady's maid, and then eventually seems to have slid down the service ladder slightly, but for interesting reasons. She eventually becomes a cook in uh, Limington, and uh, because cooks were better paid, and she wanted to earn money to move out. Now, she's about 37 at this point. And into the household in Limington comes John Gibbs, a 22-year-old young buck of a devil. Um, very handsome, quite well educated, went to national schools, starts there as a footman, and they form a liaison, a grand passionel, despite the fact that she's 19 years his senior. No, something goes wrong, and they split and separate, and they actually go off and put out, out of contact. But she never seemed to lose her fascination um, with John Gibbs and eventually through a connection of friends tracks him down to the Williams household in uh, Clan in Clan Lumley. Now the Williams household at the time he'd been taken on as a butler but it was very much a sort of gentleman's gentleman's hunting type lodge so that even one of the papers says you know it was not a very refined establishment <laughs> <laughs> uh, so basically there was this slightly sort of rough and ready so eventually she does track him down um, and this relationship kicks off again. Now this again is a problem really, because he never, it, Gibbs doesn't ever really want to acknowledge that he's in a relationship with this lady, let alone married to her. When they get married, he's married, he insists that they go to say to Jersey to do it. And then more or less wants her to stay on Jersey while he comes home, because he says he hasn't informed Williams that he's married and he could lose his position. She refuses to stay on Jersey and she goes to live in, um, dispensary court in lodgings with the Mrs. Mahoney in mm. Cardiff. Mm. And even while they initially, he starts to insist that she should be referring to herself as Mrs. Ingrams, not as Mrs. Gibbs. Now this, so he tries to keep the marriage um, secret. Mm. The, why the motives for this are never really properly analyzed or discovered as to why this sort of thing happens. Um, 
but the servants become suspicious because occasionally she turns up at the house and there's oh he's scurrying out and scurrying about but at the same time he uh, probably prior to her attempting to rekindle this relationship he's formed an attachment with the miss jones of saint melons so why he seems to be juggling the two here the joke miss the jones family and Miss Jones doesn't know that he's married. His wife doesn't know that um, he's seeing Miss Jones. Um, but he does treat her very, very badly. And you, know, mm. you don't really know why he sort of, mm. well, he just did not marry the woman in the first place. So one of the suggestions which is made during the call is the fact that she did have money and she had a lot of money. And, she, and he was obviously thinking either he could outlive her and he would get the money eventually because again, she was trying to save up the Ted's former business when she came out of service. A lot mm. of servants did that. So eventually things start to come out. Things start to come to light. Um, one, of, one of the current, he was very unpopular at Clanvermley uh, Clan Hall. They hated him. They thought he was a liar and a boaster. And uh, uh, this man who's premature had a good character and he considered very charming. Well, the other, the other staff hated him. The other staff couldn't stand him. Right. So they, never, they seldom believed a word he said. And I think it's because they realised that he was basically spinning a yarn either side of things. So they're watching him. They know that something, something is, is not quite right. Um, so on one occasion, I mean, occasionally he would take the, you know, his wife would turn up at the front door and they'd go off for walks, ridiculously long walks, mm. in very, very bad weather, in terribly dangerous environments. Oh, dear. <laughs> and you're like, what? One Sunday, they spent like, in the middle of a storm marching around marsh fields in Newport, which is full of dangerous reeds. <laughs> did, they, did they enter the forest of blood and death, Golf? <laughs> it's been more, more or less. Too. And on one, the adventure, one occasion, what he just goes, right, well, I'm going home now, darling, and abandons her by a raging river at about oh, 11 o'clock at night. So you don't know whether he's sort of. <laughs> Is it if he was planning on doing something nefarious or whether he was just hoping the poor woman would fall in a ditch? I don't know. Mm. I mean, even where the, eventually where the body is found, had it been in flood, it would have carried the body away, but it wasn't. It had a dry spell, so that's why it remained. Ah, interesting. Mm. So eventually they do, he, he writes a letter uh, inviting her to come and stay at the hall and to bring her overnight for them. Mm. So my suggestion, it's going to become a formal, you know, publicly formal arrangement. Now, she never, she never gets there. This is all coming from her landlady, Mrs. Mahoney. Um, they, she never gets to the hall. He sort of meets her somewhere else. And they're, they're seen, mar again, marching around the countryside. And goes, what else? There's a blazing row taking place late on the evening. Um, and this is there on the, when was this now? 12th of May. So 12th of May in the morning, he comes home. 1.30 in the morning. Um, the chap that he sort of shares the room with is this Miles, the coachman who can't stand him, who opens the door and says, basically, oh, you're coming home awfully late, aren't you? And he doesn't say anything. Mm. Um, in the morning, he discovers that he's not gone to bed. He hasn't slept all night. One of the other servants sees him wash, washing a pair of trousers and hanging them on the line. Um, and at which point, Mrs. Mahoney in Cardiff, in, in dispensary uh, court, uh, starts to get letters purportedly from her saying oh I'm not very well at the moment I'm going to be staying away for a while and then the letter says oh, I will move and then the letter says oh my, my husband will come around to collect my belongings and this is all going on and the poor woman hasn't been seen since the 12th of May. Mm. Um, there's an interesting little whisper in one of the stories when it says that the letters were written in an obviously feminine hand that was not his. The other woman. Well this is what you think that was never actually proved. She, uh, Miss Jones did give evidence and was called to the trial and what have you, but that doesn't that, that will never seem to be picked up on for some peculiar reason. Though, no, after the body is discovered again, he was he's in a very poor condition, they then um, set up a, an inquest inquiry in the Blue Bell Inn in St. Melons. Mm. I always find it's an absolutely fascinating part about Victorian. Uh, the murder and, and how and, and legal system is how much of it still takes place in pubs. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. right the way through. This is 1874. We're not looking mm. at something medieval here. Um, so they they journey, they go back up to the site. There's no real concept of what you call scene of crime or forensics going on really at this point. There is pathological input, um, but when they get back up there, somebody's cut all the hedges down. So you can't see. There's some argument whether she'd been pushed through a hole in a hedge or not. The hole's actually gone. 
so you can't tell, so the coroner's doubting it. They, even when they're there, they're finding in the grass one of her earrings, um, you know, blood, blood spattering on leaves, and this is weeks after the scene was originally done. So crime scene maintenance is not terribly good at all. No. But, bit, but obviously from the beginning, because of this, particularly the business has been coming back late, him being seen out with her witness as well before, and, uh, and her arguing with him vociferously, um, they do arrest him, and he goes before trial in Usk, um, which was unusual at the time, because he should have gone to Monmouth, but didn't he? He went after Usk. And, after, and, and very shortly, in a very short space of time, remember, you know, the murder took place on the 12th of May. By the 25th of August, the trial is over and done with. He's been found guilty and hung. Yeah. They don't hang around in that period. No. It's, it's interesting. An awful lot of the, the evidence for what happens is what now we would call um, uh, circumstantial, because there isn't any real, that the forensics exi does, it exist, it doesn't exist at the time. So there's no real things to absolutely tie in there. Oh, that's I mean, interesting. There's, well, there's I, one bit that you might not have read then, Goff, yeah. that uh, I picked up on, is the police kept an eye on the grave site because he'd lost his watch. As a oh, butler, yeah. he always had a watch, a fob yeah. watch, so he to tell people the time. It's like a walk-in clock. Oh. You know, what's the time, Gibbs? That sort of thing. Um, yeah. and, he, and, they know, and he was, it was said that he had a different one, slightly different from the one he normally had. So what yeah. the police did was they staked out where they'd found the body. Uh, this must have been very early in this investigation. Oh, right? yeah. It must have been they, before the arrest. And he went to the scene of the crime. That's right. They, see him, yeah. they do the, the return to the scene of the crime business. Yeah, and they chase him over fields, apparently. Yeah, Catch but again, him. but again, it's that there, there are there may be in today's terms other interpretations you forget from that. You know, did she take his watch? Was there another? Did, just because she had his watch to, and he and he knew where the site was, because everybody knew where the site of discovery was. It's all very very peculiar. But he insisted on his innocence right to the very end. Um, there's a very very salacious account. Of, of his execution, because obviously they love these various things. Um, you know, how he's on the, in the point of collapse and he's refusing to admit his guilt and he's supported by the police and everything. And then, and they, you know, they, they even go into the details of how they had to get the, uh, the correct drop depth because there wasn't a ground. They had to dig a three foot pit underneath it to make sure that he dropped into it and broke his neck. Um, even then, said he's not instantly dead afterwards, so he's slightly strangled. It's a, a horror, it's a really very interesting thing altogether. And it was a cause celebre. But everything, these things, you remember, these were um, borderline entertainment in the mm. Victorian period. Mm. Um, they invented the idea of the murder. They loved the arrival of the detective. They would follow these stories, like I said, like you would follow a soap opera, like you would follow a series, you know, mm. um, because they, they, they relished them. They were, and, and the detail in which they go into, it's almost, it's, again, it's, it's very sort of salacious. They don't pull their punches. There, there's detailed reporting of cases now, which would certainly not happen nowadays um, because they would be holding back some of this information so you didn't get people turning up claiming they did it. Mm. So, I mean, it's all very, very, very interesting. Personally, I did think he did do it. There's no, there's yeah. no, there's no, there's no question of it. There's no other, there's there. no other sort of rival suspect or theory, no, is there? No, and, and and the return to the site again. I mean, I mean, somebody could have spun it a slightly different version of it, but I mean, you know, the forensics don't really attach him in any, in some other respect. But um, yeah, why? That's the great mystery. The great mm. mystery is why they went through all all of this business. And, yeah. and he seems to have had a very good character. Even in prison, people said, oh, he was very nice, very well behaved, very pleasant man. Um, <laughs> yeah, very educated, nice young man. They make a lot of fuss about him being very good looking. Mm, ladies, man. They make a lot of fuss about her being very much older than him. Which mm. is and um, they, they even question her obsessive behaviour towards him. As if so, because the, the Victorians, if they had an opportunity as well, would turn everything into a moral uh, lecture. <laughs> And yes, of course. So the morality of it. So it becomes a very strange sort of morality tale as well mm. within the papers of it as well. Uh, but no, they, they go into as much detail as they possibly can. So, There's a lovely little bit about in uh, one of the papers explains how they go about finding out this information. They said, of course, whenever, whenever these great events happen, they literally almost that phrase, then the local neighbourhood is filled with gossip and triviality. 
and the police pick up on it. They pick up on all the local gossip and they investigate it and they go and look into it and they pick up on all these things. So this is how they track down, you know, the Miss, Miss Jones and all these various things. But at the I end mean, of the Miles, day... Miles, the coachman, had actually written to uh, his wife saying that he was, um, you know, behaving uh, badly with Miss Jones. But she oh. refused to believe it. Sadly, the poor woman, no matter how many times people told her that he was a wrong one and he was dangerous to her, would never believe it. She always believed that he was a, a marvellous man. Love is blind. No, there we are. So basically, at the end of the day, then the butler did it. The butler did it, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, poor Miss Ingram. There we are laughing at her. Yeah, no, no we don't, we don't wish to laugh at her. But, but actually, the, but, the butler did it as this kind of trope. It's yeah. a very modern one. I've looked into this. You weren't supposed to put the servants as the bad guys in murder mystery no. at a various yeah. time. It was seen as lazy yeah. somehow. But uh, yeah. the first real, well, not the first real, the first prominent bad guy butler might have been the Musgrave Ritual, Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes in 1893. But the first time a butler was a murderer in a novel that actually sold was Herbert Jenkins' The Strange Case of Mr. Challoner in 1921. But they believe that it was Mary right. Roberts Reinhardt's 1930 The Door, which sort of turned it into an absolute trope that the butler, butler did, did it. it. Butler yeah. did it. And there yeah. is a little PS to this, a silly little one, really. Of course, uh, Llan Romney Farm, where the body was found, yeah. uh, has, of course, now been built over um, as Llan Romney becomes a suburb of Cardiff. Mm. Um, so it's been built over. But in the 1960s, very close to the site of the murder, this was reported. Family flee from house haunted by white lady. Oh, good Lord. She was kept awake a lot of the nights, various nights, by the sound, it sounded like someone digging a grave. How peculiar. After weeks of this, then the white lady appeared, Kathy-like, at the window. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I mean, icy, they... icy blasts. And footsteps at midnight, rustles of skirts and the smell of perfume. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, I don't, but she was, it's not uh, poor old Susan Gibbs, because she was fully dressed in outdoor wear. So she, it <laughs> isn't, she, might, and this... she might have had a nightgown, but bless her, she never got it on. And there's also a line here which said, uh, obviously slightly exasperated, the landlord is saying, well, there have been three tenants before her and no one else has seen anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm intrigued by a little latter um, uh, headline down there. It said, experiments in loving by a local vicar. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll go back to that at some point. Better, but I also better investigate experiments in loving by a local vicar. Ooh, well, I, sorry, my back is going to be well, I think again. we've got... I'm going to be wiggling all the way through these. Oh, that's <laughs> all right. We haven't got long. We've only got five minutes or so left. But I think... Oh, right. I think the it's a good chance to actually finish Clan Rumney Hall on this one. At least this episode of Clan Rumney Hall. We weren't sure whether oh. to make it two parts or not. Because if we head into the 20th century, a wonderful local character and the last member of the Williams family to live there was at the hall. Now, he became, uh, sort of took over the place in 1913, and that was Charles Croft's Flewellyn Williams, always known as Squire Williams. Oh, yeah. yeah. Always on a horse. I mean, yeah. well into the 20th century, 30s, 40s, early 50s, you'd find him in the lanes around Clan Rumney. Yeah. Um, Freeman wouldn't have liked him, our dear old Professor Freeman, because he was a great huntsman. Uh, so mm. much so that when Lord Tredegar had to give up the Tredegar hunt through blindness and taxation, I am an old man, I can do no more, he said in 1933, yeah. there was really only one candidate who would take over as master of foxhounds, and that was Squire Williams. He'd oh, be there with interesting? He'd be there with Lord Tredegar's sister, Mrs. Mundy, yeah. who often stayed at Llan Rumney Hall. Uh, and they basically dominated things like the St. Melons show. They were the lead in local St. Melons family uh, with Squire Williams. But there was a wonderful little tale. His wife, who was an extraordinary lady, called Sisilt. And Sisilt, when, uh, when the squire had a hunting accident, she took over as master of foxhounds in his place. She was oh, a wow. lawn tennis champion. Uh, extraordinary lady. But in 1934, she was on a sleeper train uh, up to uh, Glen Eagles Hotel, where she was playing at a tournament. And so she went up there. On the way back, um, they stopped at Carlisle and realized that Cecil Williams was missing. Vanished. Oh, really? And yet a door was open. 
Oh, she had disappeared oh, from, she must have found, opened a door. It was a sleeper. She yeah. must have opened a door and she fell off the train. Oh, God. Six, six hours later, the search party <clears throat> found her near Lockerbie. She was lying. She was alive. She'd broken oh, a yeah. leg. She'd been thrown a far way, about 14 feet. They think she'd hit the grass bank. And they found her. And the first thing she said was, do you have a cigarette? <laughs> Extraordinary lady. <laughs> My yeah, goodness. How what, she... a, what a trooper, as we would have said in our days. What a trooper. She was a way. trooper. And I think Squire yeah. Williams was a bit of a trooper as well. Yeah. Quite sad in a way, uh, Squire Williams. He said his fondest wish. He said, I, I want to, you know, I want to live at Llanrumney Hall for the rest of my life. That was, his, that was his aim in life. But of course, the world was changing. Yeah. And by the time you get to post-World War II, he was a First World War hero who'd got the military cross for leading his men in 1918 under heavy German machine gun fire. Oh, gosh. He's a very brave man. He was extremely well known uh, in uh, Monmouthshire. Um, but time caught up with him, you know. Um, mm. It caught up with him. He sadly divorced Cecilt in 1950, married again. His second wife only died in 2011. Oh, good grief, good Lord. Some 60 years after yeah. her husband. And she was an extraordinary lady yeah. as well in her own right. Um, but of course, when time catches up with you, Cardiff needs to expand. Mm. And it's 1950, 1951. And they decide that the best place for expansion is Llan Rumney. They were going to build houses at Flan Rumney, and they decided the only way they could do it was a compulsory purchase order of the grounds and of Flan Rumney Hall itself, which oh, clearly broke Squire Williams' heart. Yeah, yeah. But he was a practical man. All the press say he was a practical man, but I have interviewed someone who left Tredegar House and became butler at Flan Rumney Hall, uh, and he told me that it broke it broke the squire's heart that he had to give up. Yeah, well, he must have um, But he had to give up. And very sadly, yeah. uh, about a year afterwards, Ooh. he got his gun in his new house at, uh, at, uh, in Cowbridge at Welsh St. Donat's, walked into the gun room, and that was the end of Squire Williams. Oh, gosh, what a sad end. Now, he left a note which suggests that the reason he killed himself was because he was convinced he had cancer. 18 mm. doctors had seen him. He was in constant pain and maybe he decided he couldn't, uh, didn't have a role anymore and he couldn't stand uh, the pain uh, anymore. And that was the last of the Williamses yeah. of Van Rumney Hall. Uh, a great little character, actually. And what happened yeah. to Van Rumney Hall? Well, it, <laughs> it was a remand centre uh, initially. Um, a bit like Troy House, remember? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, first that, episode. Yeah. Remand centre, then it was a hotel for a bit, then it was a pub. For many, many years, pub, yeah. as Flan Rumney grew ever closer. And what I want to do is to finish off, we're going to go to their website, because what actually happened is good news on this. And fantastic, yeah. because in 2015, uh, Flan Rumney Community Trust was formed to, to make something of a very rundown looking Flan Rumney Hall. Yeah. And they've turned it into a community hub, which was opened, uh, when was it? It was June the 6th last year, 2019. And they have oh, done an extraordinary job. So, and it's their yeah. website. So do go to their website and do go to their cafe and everything else. So let's have a little look, if I can get it up uh, on the screen here. There we are. Can you see that, Goff? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to, to finish off, we're going to go through some of these before and after photos. So there it is, looking a little bit the worse for wear. Yeah. You see a bit of the damage there. Yeah. There it is as a pub. Oh, yeah. yes, gosh. <laughs> uh, the little uh, plaque here was put up, I believe that's the plaque, uh, which was put up in 1988 for the 300th anniversary of the death of Captain Henry Morgan. Oh, right. That's a fantastic staircase. It's a, it's a lovely staircase, isn't mm. it? So we've got all of these sorts of problems and issues because mm. as we saw with Troy House, you leave a building for too long no, and you lose it, don't it. you? Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of little damage, as you can see. They had mm. an awful lot to do, but happily, if we go to the after one. Oh, well, that's looking uh, much different. Isn't it, really? Squire Williams could almost be in there, couldn't he? Yeah. Trying to run the whole over it back on. 
And if we have a little look inside. Oh, gosh. It's what they've tried to do is get in touch with their history. Some of the history yeah. that we've talked about today. Some yeah. of these paintings on the wall might be familiar to you as an old Tradiga House veteran. Yeah, they had no I, paintings. Yeah. So they had permission from Tradiga House to make replicas of some of their paintings. Oh, right. Oh, I see. To give oh, it a Morgan yeah. touch. Yeah. So we've got, uh, let me get to a decent room. There's their Captain Morgan Cafe. That's, oh, that's very, very nice, I must say. What this is, is their cellars with a little image of a tunnel because they're convinced there, are, there were tunnels from the cellars leading out. Oh. Um, whether they were or not, cellar looks great, doesn't it? Yeah, the cellar looks marvellous, doesn't it? Oh, and they put a pirate down there. He looks familiar. I think he was in the cellar at Tadiga House for a while. He gets around. <laughs> the, is, the man has no loyalty. He will go. <laughs> he is a pirate. He is a pirate in all fairness. So their cellars look great. Um, there is, is. So they've done a good job. Yeah. So it's a community hub. Um, they do all kinds of things here. The crow's nest. Yeah. yeah. Up in the eaves. Yeah. Now this is called the Llewellyn Room. Oh, so they're running with the legend. Yeah. Mogridge found the uh, the body of uh, the last native prince of Wales, and they got a little yeah. image of Llewellyn up there as well. Yeah. Oh, good. So they all go. But you see, as I look round this, there's one thing that we're missing, and there's Lady Elizabeth Day Rell for Tradiga. Oh yes, 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 yes. So Henry is there. Yeah. Um, you got Mar uh, you got Blanche Morgan there. So mm -hmm. they got a Morgan, and so lots of Morgans. I think I saw the Charge of the Light Brigade there recently. You did. It's on the side of the wall. Yeah, you, yeah. the Charge of the Light Brigade is the there. Kids there, kids there. I don't like an area for children. So they do lots of yeah. lots of things. Interesting. It gets a similar thing happened to say Malpas Court. It turns into a community hub, an enterprise zone type thing. But what I think would be absolutely wonderful, and they've what a mm. magnificent job they've done. Mm. And they do mm. ghost tours, they do uh, tours, they do oh, all yeah. sorts. Of, I mean, they've done yeah. a brilliant job. Please go mm. and support Lan Rumney mm. Hall. Or if you're Professor Freeman's ghost, Lan Rumney or Glan Rumney Hall. <laughs> you get on the wrong side of that beard. <laughs> um, but I think there's one man missing. Wouldn't it be great if they could get a photograph? He was three times in the Tatler, and his photo is many times in the Western Mail. Just get a little picture of Squire Williams. Yes, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Frame yeah, it, it put it somewhere there, so you've brought Squire Williams back Home. to Clan Rumney yes. Hall. That would be yes, such would a be, lovely yeah, touch. Yeah. It would be nice, that wouldn't it? I, yes, I, I think that's a marvellous idea. Yeah, I think, yes. I do hope they're listening. Hello, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tag them into the tweet, you see. I'm going to tweet this out, and hopefully they, they will listen. They're a wonderful bunch of people who've worked so very oh, yeah. hard. Oh, yeah, um, it is a fantastic job, isn't it? Well, thank you for that tonight, Goff. Um, that's so much. Be good fun. That's why you're the murder man. Well, it's nice to talk about. I mean, I was I, I will talk about murder until it comes out my ears. But it's nice to talk about a place you don't know so much about. I mean, I've only ever known of it as a pub. Hmm. Um, and again, I thought you thought it was an older older building than it is. But I mean, no, it's it's fantastic to see that these buildings are still getting life in it. Because it seems it seems it seems to be that when you come to saving buildings, there are different sort of ways of saving them and the current way of saving them is to do what that sort of thing is to get a local community input and turn them into hubs that's perhaps a very nice way of doing it and a lot of buildings could have been saved by that so let's hope a lot more will be saved as well i agree so a bright note to end on um yeah. thank you all for listening um no, if you if you like the video do like share it maybe and subscribe um we would be yeah. very grateful and we will be back sometime soon with another dip mm -hmm. into the past of this area Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.